you know, I'm, a, I'm an AI. And they're like, what do you mean you're an AI? You know, <laughs> so it's, it's completely foreign. So yeah, I mean, I could say, you know, interacted with, um, with Satoshi. And, you know, Parity and the Web3 Foundation have um, a clear vision of, of where it's headed. So I think Cosmos has maybe um, put it up to the community a bit more, which has seen a bit more disorganized because, you know, first there's 300,000 dollars and then there's 2 million dollars and then there's 20 million dollars and the lowest pricing uh, gradually increases over time. Research, it can uh, organize events, it can, you know, do all kinds of things in a AI friendly way. But we're not in a place where we've got X number of months of runway and we're kind of like, shit, we have to make it in these two months, all unit network disappears. Hello and welcome to Cryptos Chain. My name is Claudio and joining me today is Michael from Unit Network. As you know, uh, we had invited people from those uh, winning Twitter polls that uh, I was doing on my Twitter because I think that it's the fairest way to get the community on board, you know, and uh, just get people to vote and uh, decide on who you want to bring on, you know, rather than me just picking and choosing who I want to bring on. So, Michael, thank you very much for taking the time to join. Uh, you, let's talk about Unit Network, but uh, of course, before we do that, I need to know more about you. So if you could please uh, maybe give us a bit of breakdown, like how did you get started into crypto to begin with? Definitely. So a um, bit of background, I'm half Singapore and half British. I've uh, been building applications and software for the past 15 years, uh, since I was about 13 or 14. Um, oh. Got into crypto in 2009, 2010. I was very interested in encrypted peer-to-peer -peer software. I built a video conferencing app that allowed two parties to have a video call with one another without going through a central entity. Um, so I was very fasc fascinated about distributed and decentralized applications. I was also working with, um, I, I also built the Android app for WikiLeaks. So when the governments froze the Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, uh, donation channels, bank accounts, uh, we were forced to use Bitcoin and I was uh, helping to lead the fundraise there. Um, and overall, very excited about new technologies and seeing how that they can uh, evolve and provide a, um, a new way of doing things. I was very early in uh, mobile, so I, I got the first iPod Touch, the first iPhone. When the App Store came out, I built some of the early um, iPhone apps there. Um, also, very early in Web 2.0, when Ajax and um, applications on the web started coming out. I, I was really excited to build social apps there. So, um, yeah, I, I really think digital assets, blockchains are really in its infancy and they're going to change the world and grow in ways that people can't even imagine. When did you buy maybe your first Bitcoin or Ethereum? Definitely. So 2010, got my first Bitcoin, nine cents. Uh, as, as mentioned, oh, I'll work at WikiLeaks, uh, help lead the Bitcoin fundraise. Um, yeah, so wow, quite that's fortunate, really. Way, way back. That's amazing. Wow. So you're a real OG then. I don't think like Tone Vase is, is also an OG. I know he's kind of like a Bitcoin maximalist, you know, he's a trader. But he's been in it for like so long, you know, he's been praising Bitcoin for so long, but you've been, you've started even before him. So did you actually like chat on the, uh, on that forum with Satoshi by any chance or? Yeah. I mean, if, if you go look into the history and you see uh, Satoshi's last post, he was yeah. actually um, criticizing the work that um, I was working on WikiLeaks with, with the fundraise. He said it was bringing too much attention uh, to, to Bitcoin at this stage. Um, so yeah, I mean, I could say you know, interacted with, um, with Satoshi. And yeah, so oh, quite, amazing. quite, quite cool to have been involved in such an early piece of Bitcoin history. Let's find out what is Unit Network. Definitely. So, to, I, I guess before what is Unit Network to understand why is Unit Network. So, you know, we basically recognize that there is a huge wealth and equity in the world, and we think the wealth and equity is what saw what causes lots of problems. You know, from environmental issues to social issues, homelessness, opioid abuse. Um, you know, political issues, geopolitical instability. We think it stems down to economic reasons. And why we think it stems down to economic reasons is because there's there's two groups in society. There are the founders and the investors, that's on one side. And then we've got customers and employees on the other side. So we've got the owners of things and we've got the people that help create value, the customers and employees, but they don't get any ownership. They don't get any upside. And we basically think that this idea of the token economy, you know, powered by something like unit is going to bridge that inequity. It's going to make the founders and investors more money. It's going to help them, you know, have more likely, more successful businesses and projects and the customers and employees will get a piece of the pie. So, you know, we, we believe that unit is the tool and the operating system to help us to get to this future where there's tens of hundreds of millions of, of assets and tokens, um, which operate digitally and they sit on top of existing companies or people or projects. And, um, yeah. Then why Polkadot? Definitely. So, 
we believe that Polkadot and specifically Substrate is the most advanced way of, of building a blockchain from scratch. And the way we like to think um, a layer, um, you know, building on a, on a, a general purpose chain versus building an application specific chain is like, you know, if you want to build a building, you can rent land or you can buy land. So in, in one scenario, you know, you're, you're basically renting land. You've got a landlord, which is, you know, going to charge you rent every time your building becomes more valuable. Every time your building grows, if you want to sell the building, you know, you, you have to worry about the, the underlying land, you know, having an issue. If you own your own land, if you build your own, you know, blockchain, like on Substrate, I think the alternatives are uh, Cosmos or um, let's say Avalanche or Subnets. Um, that, that is where I think all projects built on general purpose chains will move towards. Yeah. So we, we think Polkadot is the most advanced for doing that. Uh, we really like how uh, technically it's worked very well thought through. Um, we have a very good team of Rust engineers and um, yeah, we, we, we're really excited and confident on this future where both the unit network is, and as well as various aspects of centralization within our industry move to a point of being entirely distributed and decentralized. Now we know that Cosmos is very similar to Polkadot in many ways, but we know that Polkadot offers forkless upgrades. So if Cosmos would have offered forkless upgrades, would you have considered building there instead or would you have still chosen Polkadot? Good question. So I think the choices would have been really similar. So it's kind of like, you know, if someone's getting a smartphone, you know, they're likely going to get an Android and an iPhone. So we, we saw these as two natural picks. I, I do like that, um, you know, Parity and the Web3 Foundation have um, a clear vision of, of where it's headed. So I think Cosmos has maybe um, put it up to the community a bit more, which has seen a bit more disorganized. Um, I I'm, I was and am quite close with the Web3 Foundation and the Parity team since 2017, you know, before Polkadot was even the first get commit, before the first bit of code was written. Um, yeah. So I, I've really been quite close to them and followed the progress. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's been the, um, I actually met the Cosmos team before I met the Polkadot team also in 2017. So it was, <laughs> it was an e easy choice between either of them. Um, but I, I do think Polkadot offers the best framework and um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited and confident for its future. They're also, the idea of Focus upgrades, I think are fascinating because they're more similar to traditional application development and they offer an easy way for projects to evolve and um, upgrade over time. So let's talk about uh, parachains. I know that a uh, while back you were mentioning that you had launched your parachain on Rokoku to test it out there. Uh, but when do you estimate that you're going to launch on Polkadot? Definitely. So we have launched on Kusama as, as Alpha Network. So this is our Canary Network, our test network for rolling out new upgrades and changes. Um, on Polkadot, you know, with, with the recent announcements that Polkadot decoded, it seems to be phasing away from a slot-based model. So um, I had a, had a really good conversation with Robert Habermeyer um, in January in uh, Buenos Aires at the Polkadot Academy, where we, we brought on several engineers. Um, and, you know, it seems like there's a huge shift um, to a um, para thread, like defaulting like a para thread cell model with the cores that they mentioned, very similar to Heroku or Amazon Web Services. So I'm really excited for that. I think it makes a lot more sense. Um, and then, you know, when the ecosystem develops, when it's much more stable, then they can offer, you know, an, a, you know, an unlimited sort of more uh, para chain like model. I think they could have taken the para thread approach to begin with and then moved to the para chain approach because you know there is a lot of opportunity cost in bidding for a chain locking up dot um because your lease starts because those dots are locked up um because you want to launch a, a you know a growing market versus a, you know a bear market so i do think i I'm, I'm quite excited for how they are progressing and moving forward there um in terms of unit you know we're effectively an operating system for businesses so if you think about you know someone could say hey um are you guys looking to get more developers to build on top of unit you could say we're more like Shopify or we're more like, um, you know, a, a software as a service uh, technology where what what we expect to build on, on unit are like restaurants. They're, um, you know, a freelancer, a, um, a small business, you know, and, and the idea is that these small businesses will have DAOs or tokens that sit on top of them. And then this will allow the, the ownership to be slightly more decentralized and distributed. The the liquidity for people, the founders, the investors, the community, um, and, and we provide a, a lot of different features for um, people who are built, who are using the unit network. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, an exchange, you know, 
options. And do you think those are very important within unit network as a whole, or, or do you think they can also be corrupt as well? So we are effectively a DAO builder. So the same way you can launch a token and DAO on unit, you know, you can launch a, um, a, a, a network state. So you can think of us as a network state builder. You know, we have over 1500 um, assets and, and DAOs on unit network. So I think we're one of the largest, um, you know, DAO platforms. So effectively, this is the unit network. You, you can basically have a wallet, profile, explore page. So I'm going to show you what it's like to um, create a cryptos chain DAO. So you basically go crypto chain, hit create. And then just like that, you know, it's created the cryptos DAOs, crypto chains DAO or token. You can see there's a hundred thousand of them. Uh, there's no uncircle at the moment. I'm the manager of it. There's no capital in the bank. There's nothing in the treasury. Um, you know, someone could use this QR code to be invited. We could add some team members to it. Um, you can also put some status updates. Um, there's no advisors yet. Um, the exchange is pretty cool. So once you, you sell some crypto chains uh, DAO or token, you can add it into the pool. And then we've got an of USDU and crypto chains, and we have an, an AMM that sort of uh, determines the value between um, the, the current price of the crypto chains um, asset. So is then, USDU going to be like a stable coin of the unit network ecosystem? Spot on. So we have um, 40,000 users at the moment, and they're you know interacting with USD on a daily basis. Um, and we think our, our stable coin is better than all the other stable coins that exist because it's uh, crypto backed and it's, um, it's um, decentralized properly and distributed and has a very clear um, operating model. Um, and then, you know, we've got all of these apps. So if you wanted to, let's say, create an auction. Uh, so let's go to the auction. Let's say, um, where's the auctions? I'll set up a sale round. Um, Options. Yeah, down here. Options. Now, when you say um, create a token, I mean, what are what are the risks there with creating a token for a DAO? I mean, could that not have like legal implications? Definitely. So we think, you know, regulatory wise, there's a lot of jurisdictions which um, aren't very supportive of DAOs or tokens. They don't understand digital assets. Um, there's a lot of risk for retail holders um, and investors. So the current regulatory um, environment isn't su super supportive of DAOs or of digital assets at the moment, but we're confident it's going to change. You know, the same way, um, you know, if you set up a shop um, in um, a city, typically you need to apply for permits. You know, you need to apply for worker permits, you need to apply for a shop permit, you need to uh, have health and safety, you need to, you know, do all of these steps. Now, if someone creates a Shopify store, you know, what, where's the health and safety permit? You know, where is the yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. um, workers permit? You know, it's like, um, how did the deliveries happen? You know, it's like all, all of these things, right? But it's seamless to set up to my shop. Uh, same is if you um, set up a podcast. You know, if you wanted to launch a newspaper, you know, back in the day, you know, it's a lot of places you need to get permits. You need to be a, an o official media authority. You need to get a media pass. You need to register with the, um, you know, let's say the Reporters Bureau or the Media Association, right? Otherwise, you know, you're illegally creating content, right? Yeah. And now with something like Instagram or something like YouTube, you know, if you, you can just seamlessly, you know, be a, a content creator. So we're, we're super uh, convinced and, and excited about this future of digital assets and digital entities and DAOs, nation states, network states that sit on top of uh, local entities. So, you know, you might have a, um, a company in, you know, Germany or in, in um, Philippines or Indonesia or Kenya. Colombia, you name it, and you'll have a digital entity on unit that sits on top of your local company. You can use this to fundraise, you can use this to uh, move your earnings to, you can use this to govern the organization, you can use it to create more engagement, you can use it to sell products. Um, yeah, so the, the possibilities are endless. You know, you can even extend this to say, you know, nation states, you know, the idea of um, countries, yeah. you know, they, they, they seem like they've been around forever, right? Yeah. But they're not even that old. You know, you look at the, um, you know, modern day Germany, you know, not, not in 1989, right? It used to be East and West Germany. You look yeah. at uh, Singapore, you know, where, where I was born, you know, it's, it's what, 60, 60 years old, 50 something years old. You look at um, Hong Kong, you know, you look at, um, you know, the European Union, that's something that's super yeah. new, right? So I'm convinced that network states, things like Bitcoin, Polkadot, Ethereum, BNB, Unit will supersede the tr traditional banking system as well as uh, in nation state system, system, the idea of borders, the idea of passports, like th these, these concepts and um, artifacts will disappear, I think, in the next 
10 to 15, maximum 20 years. And I'm actually curious, how are you, or are you planning to, or maybe you're already incorporating AI into unit network in any way? Because I'm seeing a Absolutely. lot of so, uh, interesting functionalities there when it comes to creating a DAO so easily, setting up the whole structure absolutely. and everything. Absolutely. So w one thing that's really cool is the current world, you know, isn't built for autonomous machines. You know, um, if if an, an AI said, "Hey, I'm going to set up a Shopify store and I'm going to sell products on it and I'm going to order some stuff of drop shipping or you know, order something from the fa factory um, to to produce and sell." It requires a human there, you know, and the way we've built the unit network is such that, you know, an autonomous agent can set up an entity, you know, it can fundraise for that entity, it can, you know, do research, it can uh, organize events, it can, you know, do all kinds of things in an AI friendly way. You know, it doesn't require, you know, the use of a credit card, you know, it doesn't require use of a, of a human identity, you know. It, yeah it's, it's going to unlock and create significant amount of value the same way you know an ai can't just create a company at the moment it can't walk into you know um whichever you know register and say hey you know i'm a i'm an ai and they're like what do you mean you're an ai you know <laughs> so it's, it's completely foreign but uh you know this idea of let's say you know an ai um a piece of technology creating a youtube channel creating content monetizing for that content you know i, I really i'm really convinced that's the future Another key aspect of AI, which I'm really excited for, is currently a lot of investing is done by people, you know, and it's done in a very qualitative way. So it's kind of like, imagine someone comes to you and says, hey, Claudio, you know, um, I've got this project, uh, please invest in me. Um, and then they start saying, oh, this is the company I used to work for. Uh, these are the deals we have, da, da, da. And you're trying to go, okay, do I think this is going to make it? You know, do I believe that they've got yeah. the hunger? Do they have the, the network, it's nasty, the grit? Uh, the connections, da da da, and then you're like, okay, here, I'm gonna throw a dart and see if it lands, right? And yeah. it's it's very much like rolling dice and seeing what will happen. We're convinced that AI will play a much bigger role in early stage investing. And you know, you could go and say, hey, I want to invest in a hundred restaurants in Spain, you know, which are three to five people in their team, which are profitable, which um, you know, make this amount in earnings. The problem with um, investing on the public markets like the stock exchange or investing in early stage companies, the data is just not good enough. You know, yeah. it's either manipulated, it's, um, you know, subject to fraud, it's, um, you know, not 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 um, likely for you to get any liquidity if you invest in something early, unless it gets acquired or goes public, you never see that money again. So, you know, we're really convinced that this future where everything is publicly traded and cooperatively owned is, is mostly are going to happen and we think unit is going to play a big role there okay wow that's big interesting stuff i think a lot of interesting stuff are going to happen now especially with ai taking over you know i think there are so many opportunities to just integrate and take advantage of those benefits so obviously there are cons as well with ai as we know but uh, hopefully the benefits are going to outweigh the cons you know uh, let's talk about Absolutely. the network uh, coin itself so what role is it going to play uh, is it a utility coin is it a what what role does it play basically just give us more information. definitely so you can think of it as a utility coin a governance coin it's a way of keeping the network sound uh, we provide all of these 32 apps and, and uh, core functionality um, to the unit DAO or token um, the way we look at assets and tokens is they will need to be backed up by um, similar fundamentals as traditional companies so you know if you try and evaluate a startup or a business or a traded stock, you usually use two models. You use either discounted cash flows or you use a multiple in earnings. So if let's say Apple makes, you know, a hundred billion dollars a year and it trades at a three trillion dollar valuation, that's about 30 times earnings. And someone might say that's too high, that's too low. So effectively with unit, you know, the unit uh, token, um, Every, every time there's an exchange happening on the unit network, let's say, you know, someone buys $100 worth of Claudio, or someone buys a um, $1,000 worth of cryptos, chains, uh, cryptos, chain um, no. tokens, 0.5 tokens, sorry, 0.5% of that goes into the unit treasury. So effectively, th that is the accrual of fundamental value that is backing up the unit uh, token. And... Um, that's what uh, at any time people can see what the lowest price is of the of the unit token as well as any other token. So if, let's say you know we, we showed you earlier the cryptos um, chain token has a hundred thousand supply. If there was two thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, of Ethereum, of BNB, of Matic, of Sol, of Atom in the treasury, that means the lowest price is three dollars. Means it could be trading on the exchange for five dollars, seven dollars, twelve dollars, fifteen dollars. 
but it's not going to drop below the $3 price point. And that basically tells people what the underlying is, underlying value versus the speculative value. And we're, we're really convinced that this is going to be the future of um, of the industry. So how, how is that actually going to hold? Because now you got me curious, like how, how can you ensure that it never drops below that value? Good question. So basically it means that, you know, someone who holds the crypto chains token can always go to the treasury and take out the $3 price point. So there's $300,000 worth of digital assets there. There's 100,000 total tokens. So they know that there's $3 per token in the worst case scenario. But, but you, you know, if you hold some of these tokens, you're not going to sell it for $3 if you believe that there's more coming in. You know, you're going to sell it for $4 or $5. You're not going to sell it for $2.50 because if you sell on the exchange for $2.50, someone's going to buy it up for $2.50 and they're just going to go to the treasury and redeem it from there. Okay, so it's redeemable from the treasury because it's always backed exactly. by that stable coin that you mentioned, which is part of the unit ecosystem. That's how you were saying exactly. it. Exactly. And it's... Okay. And it's backed by Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dart, BNB. So all these, we we support 16 different chains and reserve assets. So so this is super simple. You know, this idea of a, floor, a lowest price, a true lowest price. With NFTs, they've got floor prices, but that's not really a floor because the floor is not supposed to go down. But in yeah. this scenario, you know, if people redeem from the treasury, the lowest price doesn't go down because effectively the, the, the circulating, the total supply decreases as well as the treasury decreasing, but there's still $3 per, to per token inside the treasury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's always going to be enough in the treasury to redeem, right? To make sure that exactly and that price exactly. And over time, you know, if if you do a really good job with the with the project collectively as a community, um, that treasury is going to grow because you know first there's three hundred thousand dollars, and then there's two million dollars, and then there's twenty million dollars, and the lowest pricing uh, gradually increases over time. That's what I was going to ask you. So that floor price actually does gradually increase, does it? If the treasury grows. Okay, that's interesting. Wow. Spot on. And it's up to you as a operator to share with your community, how is the lowest price going to grow? It's going to grow because we sell these products and services, because we've got a really good marketing team. You know, we have very sound operations, good economics, low cost, high margins. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. this is a way for all businesses in the world to create tokens and then have people buy those tokens, knowing that, you know, the underlying value of the tokens is actually, you know, clearly back. It's not just, okay, I'm going to buy it because I know, you know, Claudia's got good friends, which is going to sell it to, and they're going to buy it because he knows he's got other friends going to sell it to. And then someone has left holding these, you know, bag of worthless tokens. So you are saying about the unit coin, so that's going to be used for transaction fees for securing the network, but will it also be used to pay, like say, when you create a DAO, does it require unit for that as well? Uh Absolutely. So a small amount of, you know, effective gas fees are required. Um, and, you know, when people create an auction, people, do, you know, do any of these on-chain actions. And we'll, we, we've, we've built in a way such that all of these things from subscriptions to polls to rewards to news are entirely on-chain. So, you know, a lot of applications like OpenSea or, you know, DYDX, they, they have an element of centralization whereby, if, you know, the centralized order books or the, you know, the images held on Amazon Web Services, um, you know, disappear, then, you know, OpenSea or DYDX is kind of, you know, redundant, right? We've built in a way such that, you know, there's no images, there's no centralized, um, you know, store of, you know, data, you know, it's, it's all done in a decentralized, kind of similar to how Bitcoin or Ethereum or Polkadot is, is thought about from first principles. Okay. No, but my question was more in relation to like, is there a cost associated to creating a DAO or just the transaction fee and that's it? Just the transaction fees. So, okay. um, Effectively, the main um, economic value, you could say, utility value of unit is being able to redeem from the treasury as well as to pay for transaction fees. Yeah, so no, the reason I wanted to know that is because uh, a lot of like coins in the Polkadot ecosystem, they usually have uh, utility of securing the network. So it's for validators, for nominators, staking, and for transaction fees and also to vote in governance. But the majority of them don't actually have a utility for the product so for example like say you need to lock up this amount of coins in order to use this product so to me that's a bit challenging i think because if you're an investor you know you want to see like growth over time and i can understand that of course if unit does succeed then it would there will be a need because all these different entities are going to be creating DAOs, and so there's going to be a lot of transaction activity there which which makes sense but i would like to ask more in the sense of like a, a small cost per product. So do you think that's something that could be implemented as well eventually? Or do you think that Absolutely. could hurt unit if, if Absolutely. Done? Definitely. So there is a small cost incurred when people, you know, create contests. They want to, you know, set a task, distribute that to holders. 
uh, who complete the task. Or we have like a meet feature, which is kind of like Tinder for meeting other token holders, you know, of DAOs created. Or we have like questions feature like Yahoo questions. All of these require a very small amount of unit gas. Um, the reason why we, you know, have as a collective community and team decided not to charge a higher fee for that is because the amount to be made is minuscule compared to the exchange fees. So if you think about, you know, what are the most profitable businesses in the or entities, organizations in the blockchain sphere at the moment, they're, they're the exchanges. And, you know, by charging a very small amount of a huge amount of transaction volume, you know, that's where, you know, the real economic value is created. So you can think of all of the features as, as effectively loss leaders and they reduce the cost of transacting down to close to zero. And the idea is as the economy grows, um, when people trade and exchange and um, swap tokens between one another, they come to a pain that 2% fee, but that 2% fee adds up to be much, much more. So I'll give you an example, you know, Binance, they do about 10 billion in trading a day. You know, they grew to about being 80 billion a day. So let's say if we did a hundred million a day, which is, you know, 1% of what they do now in a bear market and, you know, much less than 1% of what they did in a bull market, um, a hundred million in trading a day would generate half a million dollars in treasury growth for the unit treasury, right? If it was just trading unit token, it would be, um, a million a day, but let's say half a million a day across the network. Um, that's $182 million a year in treasury growth. Now it's, I guess that's a dollar, uh, that's, you know, increasing the lowest price. Um, but it's also as a token holder, you can say what multiple am I willing to pay of this, um, treasury growth. So it's, yeah, it's as simple as that. Now let's talk about, uh, one of the challenging questions because it is the bear market, financial sustainability. How are you guys doing in terms of runway? I'm talking about more in terms of time frame to sustain unit network and to hit those roadmap milestones and to deliver the product. Definitely. So we are uh, economically, um, sustainable at the moment. You know, we have effectively, you know, no cost, you know, we have a team of 30 plus people and our core team. Um, though we are in, I wouldn't say this worry free mode, but we're not in a place where we've got X number of months of runway and we're kind of like, shit, we have to make it in these two months, all unit network disappears. We think we're more akin or similar to Bitcoin, whereby, you know, it's a piece of technology that has been released. People are building on top of it and there's no chance of Bitcoin running out of money. There's no active payroll for Bitcoin, you know, mm -hmm. compared to something like Ethereum, um, or, you know, many foundations, you know, um, Parity and Web3 included, there is a month of runway or there's an idea of, hey, we need to get to profitability. In the case of UNIT, you know, um, there has been $13.5 million plus um, of U UNIT token sold. All of that went into the treasury. Um, so, you know, all of the, the, it's not a traditional business per se, where, you know, money gets raised, it gets spent, and then it, it kind of has these months of runway where if it doesn't raise the next round, it disappears. You know, what we've built is similar to a piece of open source software that is you know this key center is distributed yeah but, but what about the core team at unit so in order for the devs to be paid how are they being paid from the treasury i guess right so how long do you no it's not from the treasury so the, the thing about the treasury is you can't take capital out of there because it backs the lowest price you know this is ah, yeah, a true. bank and a treasury so the bank is for operating value the treasury is setting up that lowest price right yeah. so if it moves to the treasury it can't be taken out so effectively you know any costs that we have incurred um have been funded by our, our team so you know whether it's developers or marketing costs or um you know you name it that's been personally funded by mem various members of our team and majority of the capital that has been raised has been from our team that's you know been such a big believer of it that they've uh, bought into the project to um to receive the unit tokens. So very different to a typical project where the founders get 100% and then you know you sell equity or you sell ownership. In the case of unit, everyone who holds unit has had to buy it. How do you plan to market unit network to the wider audience so that you can attract retail, so that you can attract those communities to create those DAOs eventually? Like, are you working with any content creators? Are you, I know we're doing this interview here. This is a free interview, by the way. But uh, just, you know, like in terms of, promotion outside of Polkadot, outside, you know, to bring people from other ecosystems in. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So we have five different um, initiatives. So it's R-E-M-E-L, research, edu uh, events, media, education, and our launch pad. So we have our core team working on building each of these. Research is trying to understand various ecosystems. Um, events is organizing live and online events. You know, we've done research. I think we've published like 20 research reports already. Um, events with participated in countless, I would say maybe like 60, 70 different live events. And, you know, we've hosted online events with tens of thousands of people. 
We have a media team that's focused on traditional mainstream media as well as social media. Uh, we have a education team where, where we have an education program for over 16,000 graduates. And we have a launchpad team, which is, you know, supporting in, in, um, in help, helping project and teams launch their tokens and browsing unit. Uh, we've got three ecosystems that we're focused on. It goes CIC, cryptos, industries and cities. Cryptos are things like, you know, uh, DOT, ETH, BNB, Matic, Sol, all the different blockchains that we support. Um, we, we, we're working on building their um, usage on unit. Um, industries, so cryptos include, you know, NFT communities too, which we're going to announce some really exciting um, announcements, uh, stable coins, um, industries, so things like the fashion industry, music, film, hotels, um, art, sports, big industries that we think, you know, unit and the token economy are going to revolutionize. And then cities, we basically looked at the biggest um, financial hubs as well as uh, city hubs in the world, places like London, Dubai, Hong Kong, um, you know, Singapore, uh, Sydney, Mumbai, you name it. And we're effectively building up these city DAOs or these city tokens. And we think that's going to be the catalyst to get people behind the token economy. Uh, one thing we haven't mentioned um, in this interview, which I think is revolutionary, is this concept of vaults. You know, we talked about the treasury earlier. You know, the vaults are a really cool way of how we've managed to uh, bridge the 16 different blockchains into the unit token economy. So we support, yeah. you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Sol, Algorand, BNB, Matic, um, USDT, USDC. Um, yeah, all of these different, you know, billion dollar ecosystems. People basically deposit onto the unit network. And instead of that, um, these funds that they're deposited being held in a centralized way, like wrap Bitcoin or, um, you know, Binance or Coinbase or, you know, many centralized exchanges or centralized bridges. What happens is these get distributed to one of the vaults. So effectively, people use unit to create a vault, let's say a Bitcoin vault or a DOT vault or a BNB vault or a Sol vault. And based on the amount of unit they hold, they get to custody a, a, um, a proportional amount of Bitcoin on the network. So let's say, you know, someone deposits 100 Bitcoin and let's yeah. say you hold, you know, 50% of all of the uh, unit in the Bitcoin vault. I hold 20%, someone holds 10%, some other people hold 20%. That means that 50 of the Bitcoin will be held in your custody. And we don't have to trust a single entity getting hacked or, you know, um, being compromised. We, yeah. it, it's decentralizing that. Oh, it sounds like you've got a lot of work coming up. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I think we've covered everything here. I just have one final question for you. And that is, what is one thing in life that you truly desire? Good question. So I, for me, the fundamental reasoning why we are building the unit network is to solve the wealth inequity. So there's a small minority in society that um, doesn't have to worry about economic means, doesn't have to worry about money. And the vast majority of society is thinking, how do I put food on the table? How do I, you know, fund my dream project? How do I um, live in this dream house? How do I get this dream car? How do I, you know, not have to worry about what type of food I'm buying? You know, how can I take care of my health? And my dream is uh, to create a world where the economic um, factors behind people's decision making is, is an afterthought. The same way the internet transformed the access to information. Now people don't worry about, hey, I, you know, I, I only have an hour um, of speaking with this expert because they, you know, they have the internet, they've got access to unlimited amount of information. Billions of people around the world have unlimited access. Uh, the mobile phone did that to communication. Most people now don't have to worry about, you know, spending a dollar or a euro, a pound a minute, you know, to talk on the phone. They can talk like this for hours, you know, and yeah. it's free, right? The communication, the information is solved. Now the access to capital, unless you're part of a small minority society, it's really challenging to um, to raise capital. It's really challenging to be an entrepreneur, to be a creator. Um, and we're convinced that this monetary bottleneck is going to be solved. And we think that the unit network is uh, going to play a big role in that. So that's that's the one thing you desire, unit network to succeed, change the world. And more importantly, more importantly, the societal change behind the economic system involving moving away from banks, moving away from centralized government governments, giving people the freedom that they truly desire. Cool. Thank you very much, Michael, for taking the time to join. Thank you as well for watching this video. And if you want to check out Union Network, I'll be posting links in the description of this video and also in the pinned comment. I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.